Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the talk. I love it, so let's start. Peter Ford will talk about cockpit. So, as we got the time to start, I will hand over the mic. Thank you. Most of the cockpit 
uh, the, what you see is written in JavaScript. And that, that JavaScript code is essentially running inside a long term Linux session. Just as if that user was on the command line interacting with the APIs in the system in the same way. Um, having the same permissions and instructions as that bottom user would, um, doing it at the screen. So, a modern Linux system has a lot of uh, different APIs that you know you use to configure or interact with you know, various parts of the system. Some of the APIs are very obvious. Um, Dbus APIs are really nice. Uh, REST APIs is a really easy to use. System D is a great example. Uh, it's got lots of Dbus APIs uh, doing all sorts of stuff. They're reactive, you know, probably doing some package changes, signals. You really know what's happening with the access to the system. Uh, others are maybe a little more. Uh, chats aren't so obvious. Uh, we might have to spawn a process to do something. Um, look at what's going on and send it out. Um, or maybe you have to like, open a file somewhere. Listen to something in you know, There's a lot of different APIs. So uh, let's look at how Cockpit works for this. This is the host name change example that we um, did earlier. So here is we're typing JavaScript code uh, in the browser on the console. Um, this is the one line we use to tell copy JavaScript that you're going to talk to Dbus. Um, and um, you can interact with the Dbus API in this way. Uh, it's even easier than like, typing out the Dbus commands on the command line. And you know, that's really the whole point. We're, we're logging into the system here, uh, we're interacting with the system directly. Um, the JavaScript code is running in the uh, in the logging session. And, and really, this is like the key uh, sort of exciting feature of the document is that um, the, the code is there, the JavaScript is interacting directly with the system, there's not all the layers you've got to go through. Um, it makes building admin tools a lot more fun and a lot easier. That um, you're not you know, dealing with layer after layer, it's your you can talk directly to the system API if you want to talk to uh, using JavaScript. And of course it works both ways. Um, the, if you do something on the terminal, um, provided you know, it's a well open API, uh, immediately the browser is notified about it, the browser can update itself, and the UI can change uh, in the appropriate way. Uh, here's another example, uh, spawning a process. Again, it's just a simple one-liner in the cockpit JS library. Uh, here is spawning ping. Uh, it's pretty quick and easy, and you see that the output gets streamed back to the browser and it's logged there. Um, and another simple example uh, this is just reading a file. Um, you can specify the file name you want, top of the file, and uh, you get the contents of the file uh, streamed back to the browser. So, uh, of course, there's a lot more supported operations, you know, things that you're going to want to do uh, on the file system. Uh, writing, writing files, monitoring, uh, connecting to sockets, um, doing HTTP requests. Um, but let's, let's move on and we'll get specifics and talk about how it's all put together. So, if you're logging to Cockpit, you look closely at uh, what runs after you log in. Uh, you notice a process called Cockpit Bridge. Um, Cockpit Bridge doesn't know how to do things, like things we showed before. It doesn't know how to um, you know, create a bond or uh, change a filter or do anything like that. All it does is it receives messages on standard in and outputs messages on standard out. Um, an incoming message might be the instructions to open a connection to this DBus service, talk to this thing in HTTP, read this file. And it's going to um, set those instructions, do what it knows how to do, and asynchronously uh, return the results or of, of those commands uh, uh, back on the standard app. Uh, the JavaScript code that runs in the browser, it's listening to those responses, and when it gets those responses, it reacts in the appropriate way, and updates the UI. Um, obviously, the browser can't talk directly to standard in and out, so that's what the web software is for. Um, 
the cockpit uh, WS or web service um, process uh, makes the web socket available to the browser uh, that it can use to pass messages in. Any message that it gets in, it passes along to the bridge. Any responses from the bridge, it sends it out, it passes back up, uh, to the web socket, and that's how the browser uh, can consume uh, One other little point here is that when you first log in, um, the browser obviously needs the JavaScript and the HTML and stuff that's going to run, and so it's talking about this little web server and it should return that uh, to the browser as well uh, after the login. <coughs> So, uh, you're probably uh, wondering about security. Um, browsers are going to with the system. How does this all work? Um, so, the key component of the login session is this identity. Who you log in as? Uh, I don't know if you know what you need to get into the system. Uh, the way it works is the, the SSHD process is what authenticates you. It takes care of running your boot camps back, making sure that you have the right permissions. And then it uh, spawns your shell with a specific UID and GID. Um, so, Cockpit does pretty much the same thing. When, you're, when your browser um, first connects to Cockpit, you don't get um, the session, there's no bridge, you've got to authenticate first. You make the call to authenticate. Um, only after that happens, then you're able to start calling the corporation. So, let's uh, take a look at what happens when uh, you do the login. You can see there's nothing going on, there's no copy processes running at all. Um, uh, when we decide to hit it, that's when the cockpit web service process gets socket activated. Um, and it starts up, it's running as an unprivileged user, it doesn't matter what the user is, especially if that missing link on the stuff to do almost nothing. Um, and it's just um, basically serves this page and gets the login. Uh, when you get a successful login, first of all, you see that there's a cockpit session process. Uh, it's running as a root, and it's the uh, SQID uh, binary, and it's what starts running if you move the hand um, You, it, it, it gets spawned, it checks the authentication, it uh, makes sure you have access, and then if all that passes, it starts up the cockpit uh, inside that session. You can see the terminal inside of the cockpit. It's very clear. Logged in here as the user step. It's a fully featured session. You can see it with login CTL. Um, you can use login CTL to query more about it. It's a regular Linux session. Um, so everything that happens from this point on is running through the cockpit bridge. Um, with the message being packed back and forth, and that's being run as the user that's involved in it. So uh, that's why you can say the JavaScript code is really running all in the session. Everything that it does, everything it asks to do is messages being passed to the copy bridge, which is running as a user. When the copy has to do something that involves a privilege escalation or something like that, it will try to use pseudo or circuit, depending on uh, how the system is configured, what the scenario is, and it only succeeds if that user does in fact have those permissions to do that. And, you know, is able to possibly like a pseudo or, you know, get you know, a pull or something like that. Um, you can see here what happens when we log out. Uh, when we log out, the top bridge, um, bridge and session goes away, and then after a little bit, if nothing else is using the web socket, that goes away as well. And there's nothing else. So, um, if you're running uh, the JavaScript as the login user, you really want to be sure that only the code that you want to be running is in fact running the JavaScript. Nothing else gets access to that web socket, nothing else gets access to that bridge. So, uh, preventing things like um, man in the middle attacks, uh, XSS attacks, request forgeries, things like that, it's pretty important uh, for a programmer problem. So, we started uh, implementing um, a content security policy in Kafka. It's not new really yet. Uh, some components are uh, using all the way, and some still have a few exceptions here and there. Um, but basically, the idea is that it's sort of like a rough comparison might be like SM Linux for the browser. And basically, you you can tell the browser that where the source of the JavaScript code is that you want to allow it to run on this page. 
So you can say the code has to be stored from the server, from these files, from this place, otherwise it doesn't matter. So if there's any kind of on clicks or emails in the code or um, inline script tags that get injected somehow or something, none of that's the browser will refuse to run all that and see like, what the, the message looks like. And even stuff like C CSS you know, changes coming from outside, all that uh, get along. So that's pretty important to, uh, you know, to help keep the security of what's going in the browser. Um, so one of the things that uh, you often expect uh, from a login session is as we also run different tools or applications. So uh, you can see here, sort of the, the Kotlin screen, there's a lot of different um, Packages, so those are the are the list of uh, tools and uh, services on the side there. And essentially, each one of those is sort of its own self contained um, package. They run an iframe in the browser separate from each other uh, and just interfere with each other at all. Um, there is like one overarching shell that kind of coordinates among them, but um, they're all pretty separate and they're often packaged very separately. A lot of times, they're being their own RPMs or you know, whatever. Distro packaging format is. Um, it's also really easy to build your own uh, bits of UI that interact with, uh, that you can use the Cockpit JS library and Cockpit Bridge and do whatever. There's a lot of really good examples that have time to pull them all together, but uh, on GitHub, if you're interested in seeing how easy it can be to like, you know, throw up a custom, a custom mode of text for, you know, and use the tool that you use. Um, of course, like you see before, there's a fully featured terminal in the cockpit. Anything that runs in the terminal um, will run just as well in the cockpit if you want to do that. Um, so, and see an example there um, in a standard stuff. Uh, this one here uh, is a little more uh, wild and crazy. Uh, this uh, is using uh, GTK to using Broadway, which is part of GTK, so we run these GTK apps entirely on the browser. This works because GTK supports HTML5 uh, and it's got its own um, web socket um, support with Broadway. So uh, you can take Cockpit provide, provides the login section and wraps it. We're not actually talking to the Broadway web socket directly. Um, the JavaScript and browser is on the bridge, which is then talking to the web socket user and everything flows and you know you can use basic apps. It's more just like an example of sort of what's possible um, using sort of the cockpit uh, transports. Um, each uh, cockpit component uh, can also be embedded in like a totally different application if you want. If you don't want the cockpit shell or maybe you want to really just have um, you know, different pieces integrated separately into, into your UI and you know, something else entirely. Um, they're all, you know, can be completely separated. And, you know, so here this is just an example of uh, sort of a different, different shell, a different wrapping, and we're exposing individual ones of the cockpit interfaces, um, you know, separately on their own. Um, everything about them works the same. It's still using the same transport, the same uh, type of logging session. Uh, it's just got uh, a different sort of uh, wrapper around it. You know, it works. Um, doesn't look like the standard uh, cockpit. Uh, no. All right. Uh, so cockpit over SSH. Uh, normally, the way cockpit works, and all the examples we've been showing, is uh, we've been running the, the web server uh, directly on port. So that works for a lot of situations. A lot of other times, uh, you might not want to open what's uh, in the internet or you know even to the network. You might you might want to other ways that you might want to administer the server. So one uh, of the features of Cockpit is that every server doesn't need to uh, uh, be connected to the browser directly, uh, and it can launch the bridge and transport that showed earlier via SSH. 
So you know, maybe you uh, have one Bastion server, for example, and that's the one that runs the, the Kafka WS components, and everything else makes sense in the ASP. Uh, so this is just an example of sort of um, adding multiple servers. So I've got one here as a primary server. It's the one that uh, serves the dashboard. And uh, the dashboard is where you, you know, add another server. So uh, here's an example. We're adding another server. We've got to confirm the fingerprint. Just like you would if you're using a uh, safe terminal. Um, and in this case, uh, it all works uh, really quickly. Uh, the other server got the same user, the uh, same credentials, so uh, just log it right in. Uh, you're able to switch between them uh, easily. You can tell most, most of those popular components only work with one server at a time, and that's where the photographs from multiple ones. Uh, so let's add the atomic host here. Um, the atomic ones are a little bit uh, different. A lot of times, especially with cloud servers, you don't have the same user accounts or the same, uh, or same information. So, same thing. You know, uh, you log in, but it doesn't have the same the same users. Um, so we want to log in with a key. Um, you can use Kafka UI to load up uh, a key uh, in the browser that runs the SSH agent. Uh, again, it's part of the bridge. Uh, so we can try to log in with that. Um, again, the user's not the same, so we'll change the username to root. Because uh, that's the one where the key is authorized, and now we're able to get okay, we'll kind of So this server is going to run everything as root. You can see it's a different server. Um, and if you check what it's running as, well, you can pull the key root, so this server is doing root. Whereas your other servers, well, they're all doing um, the same one being set. So, um, an interesting thing to note here is I don't know if you noticed, but um, the list of Available packages on the side uh, is different for every server. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that, um, the, so the way it works is that every every server supplies its own set of, H, of browser packages to the browser that uh, the browser is going to run and render for like, what's available. Uh, one of the main reasons to do that is because, well, every server is different, right? Different software running on it. Um, you know, maybe some, some of your systems are common systems and you're running on OS3, some of them have subscription managers, some of them don't, you know, there's all sorts of scenarios. So you only install packages, industrial packages on that server that the ones you actually want companies to use. Um, another good reason for it is that um, every server's got its own bridge. And so the JavaScript packages only have to communicate with that bridge. So you don't have to worry about uh, version differences. So each server can work on a different version of the bridge. And that was the fact is that work with that specific version of the bridge. Um, and you can run them all in the same session using uh, SSH to connect to them and it all work because they only have to communicate with the bridge is the same version as that. Uh, so uh, going back to sort of the graph, this is what it looks like. Um, again, our primary one, we want to serve the server dashboard, really doesn't have to do much else. Uh, that one looks pretty much the same as before, but now the WS process also can spawn off these other ones that use the stage to spawn across the student cockpit bridge and then talk to them as the standard and standard app, just like it does in the local authentication. And in this case, whatever your, your hand stack looks like on the service for us to say that's what it's going to run through and that's what it means to authenticate um, each of them. Uh, by the way, the port, you know, is configurable, so whatever SSH uses, you can uh, put that in the user, if it shows configurable, so you can, you, you can have different users on different servers, you know, that makes sense. And a lot of copy on your so uh, I would assume this is what that's your goal. Um, so, for this feature, um, obviously, it's not going to scale with thousands and thousands of servers, um, and really, that's that's not the point. That's um, it's, it's one of the big differences between an interactive configuration thing like cockpit or a decorative configuration thing is that uh, so with decorative you're trying to say you, you say okay I want my services like this I want you know, this install this install and configure like this make it so and then your configuration management whatever it is is going to go as you know, which is 
bring up, bring down server, and basic criteria, or whatever. And that's really not what the talk is doing here. Talk is about being interactive, which means that you want to publish something interactive when you want to look and inspect your system, see what's going on, discover what's available, what's not. Um, and you know, maybe you'll change the configuration to be able to see how things are going. Um, but it's not about us, you know, declaring what things should be. Sometimes, obviously, the use cases might overlap, and you might want to do this really like that, but to inspect and see what's going on on the server that you know, is initially driven by something like um, set the library or something like that. Um, but generally, they're kind of in two kind of similar use cases. Um, so, uh, contributes. Uh, we um, are always looking for more uh, active contributors. Uh, we, um, there's lots of ways you can contribute, report bugs, uh, we're on GitHub, uh, join discussions, ask for features, uh, we use wikis to sort of people flesh out what a feature should look like, um, do initial design and prototyping. Um, mixed issues, of course. Uh, we are actively looking for a maintainer for uh, Hulu. So if anybody is interested, um, get in touch. Um, definitely need somebody there. Um, we, yeah, don't hesitate to post, you know, pull requests and if it's not done, you want to like throw something over the wall, say, you know, here's like the little thing I did for this feature, you know, if you like working on those pull requests, we've actually integrated quite a few features with uh, that sort of thing, where someone sort of, you know, give an initial prototype that, you know, would work for them to, you know, um, you know, fully integrate and then you know, work as a, you know, full fledged uh, package. Or so. Um, so we're on GitHub. Um, uh, there's a wiki there. Um, Popkin or Fudo is where we hang out. Um, feel free to come by, ask questions. Uh, Steps websites. Uh, we've got a lot of good information on Popkin as well. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Uh, I'm finishing a little bit early. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, Okay, I think I feel hard to do this for fun. Any questions? Questions, please wave to us. Oh, Kubernetes, yes, yeah. absolutely. 
Uh, sure. So uh, we have a, a property lot for Kubernetes, uh, we can run both as part of like a more general install cockpit, or we've actually recently finished up where uh, you can run it as just like a pod in Kubernetes and bring it up all by itself. There's no other cockpit you have, it's just Kubernetes. Uh, we're focusing on uh, making it work well with, um, for like administrators, not so much for focus on developers who are maybe developing a pod or things for like administrator gets, has the containers, you know what they need to run, they're bringing it up, managing services, reputation sets, how many resolution they want, things like that. Um, there's still definitely ways to go. I think we have the basic feature set covered. Um, it's a close for both Kubernetes and uh, open the board. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely usable both as part of the or My server is crashed, how would you handle IPMI? I'm sorry. IPMI, how, you, how would you handle it in cockpits when a server is crashed? I don't want to use IPMI, but uh, yeah, the server inside the cockpit is also down, so how would you handle that in cockpits? Um, I mean, if, if, if the server is actually down and it's not accessible, um, I, I don't think there's a lot of conflict in there. Because um, again, it, it's all just the you know, running on the, uh, on the server itself. Uh, I, I think that was the question. Right? Okay. Um, Any more questions? So, so thank you very much for your talk.